Welcome to the Storyboards Creative Cast. I'm Jen Clark Hall, and in each episode, I'll be chatting to inspirational people working in the creative industries who will share their career stories and advice. If you want to know more about creative careers, or thinking about starting up a creative business, or just want something interesting to listen to for half an hour, this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the podcast, Diane. We're talking to, with Diane Nicholson from Muddy Fingers Pottery today. So, so thank, thank you so much for, for coming on the podcast. Lovely to have you with us. Um, and we'll just, if it's okay, we'll just dive straight into the questions. So I guess the best place to, to start is for you to just give us a brief introduction to who you are and what you do. So, hello, I'm a potter with Muddy Fingers Pottery. There's um, me and my partner, Marvin, both run the business. Um, we make bread ovens, we make pottery tools, we run classes, we do um, workshops at festivals, we make um, tableware for fancy restaurants, um, all sorts of things. Just anything to do with clear really is what we do. Yeah, and that's your, that's your sort of pattern. Yep, yeah. yeah. How long have you been running Muddy Fingers for? Um, so Marv started the business about maybe 18, 19 years ago. Um, and then I joined about, about seven or eight years ago. Okay. So yeah. And what was it that um that made Marv want to start the business? Um I think he likes working for himself. So we're both we both don't really like being told what to do. Uh-huh. <laughs> Not really. Yeah, I can relate to that. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's just because you can, you can kind of like see what needs doing if you're in a job where you're employed by somebody, but it's hard to like communicate stuff to management and that, and nobody ever takes any notice here. So it's good yeah. being self employed because you can change what what needs change straight away. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. You, ma- you mentioned festivals before as well, Diane. Which um, which festivals have you been involved with? Um, we've done quite a few. We've done well. Glastonbury's the main one, but obviously it's yeah. not been on the, it all last year. Um, mm. there's Wellness. There's um, where else? Green Man Festival in Wales. Um, Salfest, Lindisfarne Festival. Mm-hmm. I don't know for them. <laughs> so you, you, you're quite <laughs> mobile. You're quite mobile as a business, so that's really handy. So like, um, we can take the kilns everywhere. We've even been um, over to Portugal to, to do raku classes. So we took the kiln, oh, some... <laughs> which was fun. <laughs> that sounds really Taking cool. Back, um, so we had like we had um, we had the kiln in one suitcase and the, the burners and everything, and then we, <laughs> we had um, like powders because you need sort of raw materials to make glazes and things up. So we had like bags of white powder, <laughs> 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 which didn't look suspect <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that was that really was interesting fun. going through customs. Did you get did you manage to travel fine without any problems and issues and things? Yeah. All the all they were bothered about was if it was gonna explode. So they were just asking oh, if it was a uh, like like fertilizer. Right, um, yeah. so they weren't bothered. <laughs> oh well that's good. Um and by the sounds of it, you you make all manner of products as well. Because I know on your website and we follow you on Instagram, there were there's you've got things from as small as coasters which i've got one here mm-hmm. i've got the one that we made in your workshop a couple of years oh, ago oh nice coaster Jen. <laughs> it's very fancy it's my, it's my special coasters nice. that the kids aren't allowed to use um <laughs> to all you were saying all the way up to clay ovens you make so that's- yeah um so i think you've got to be quite diverse um there's not just really one stream of income that we'll have in this this um COVID situation has kind of like proved that that you need to be like have your fingers in loads of different pies sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um yeah. so if we had just made tableware, then we would have been like because all the restaurants have been shut for like a year or so. If we just did classes, that would have been the same thing. Um but we'll have like an Etsy shop and um we we'll do bits with we'll have a social enterprise called the Clear Team as well. So we'll do bits and pieces with those so we'll get bits of funding from places and we're like we've made bread ovens with them before at um community centers and stuff like that we've done like clear packs for people um during the lockdown and all sorts yeah so you've got to have you've got to like do loads of different things mm-hmm. so how, how do you think how much of an impact has the, the the pandemic had on the business then have you found that it's 
it's it hasn't been too detrimental and you've been able to think about different ideas for it and, and move forward? Well, it's actually been all right for the business because we've fit into every category where we can get help from the government, whereas normally we get zilch, but um, we've had like help from the council with the rent. Um, we've had the 80% like furlough sort of um, wages, I don't know what it's called, mm-hmm. uh, like yeah. the grand that's been all right and what else we've took advantage of the um the loan the bounce back loan oh yeah mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. i think and have, you found that yeah. process, have you found the process of doing all of that quite stress-free or has it always been a bit of a stress in the background not being sure what's what's happening no it's actually been less stressful than normal because normally you've got to make your own money coming in so you don't really know what you're getting every month, but at least with this, I can kind of think, right, I'm going to get X amount from the government in three months' time. So it's like it's like having a proper income. Oh, that's good. Mm-hmm. So you felt quite supported, even though yeah. you've, be, you've been probably one of the most impacted uh, businesses in terms of you rely on things moving and people being allowed to come in and out and do things. Um, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, so like basically we had to stop it's mainly tableware and classes that we do, but we have kind of stopped the classes pretty much. I think about two months last year we could run some, but then mm-hmm. we had to like, um, like we had to take half the amount of people and stuff and like run double the amount of classes and things. So it was all a bit messed up. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, and the tableware that so obviously the company who like distribute our tableware, they've kind of like dropped off a little bit over the last few months. Um, just because the restaurants have been shut, basically. Mm-hmm. But they've just been mm-hmm. back into saying that people are starting to order, um, like, order things again. So hopefully that'll, that'll pick up again. Because you you were saying at the beginning, you um, you do bespoke <coughs> tableware for um, high-end restaurants and chefs and all sorts. We do, yeah. So we've got stuff in um, like Tom Carriage's restaurant, The Hand and Flowers. And we've got stuff in Burberry, um, like the Auto Arena. We have a so we used to do a lot of market stalls, um, and there was one in Stockton, I think it was. And this lady and gentleman come up, and they, they were saying that they really liked our pottery, and they were like, um, they supplied restaurants. So we sent them some samples, not really half believing them because loads of stuff just doesn't amount to anything when you meet people at market. Um, so. <laughs> so we kind of like um give them some samples and then they started ordering things and then um I don't know where I'm going with this story now I don't know what the question was I just totally just forgot. talking about like how how you got your <laughs> tableware and things yeah. into restaurants and um but basically made a name for yourself to to be tableware producers and being able to get your your stuff that you've designed in into into the restaurants and the shops. Uh-huh. So most of that was from um, the company's called Goodfellows and they're kind of based in um, Peter Lee. They've got a head office there, but they've got a showroom in London. So they've got like um, like contacts to all the, the really nice, oh, fancy okay. restaurants. All the and ones they... we can't afford to eat in, that's the ones <laughs> we have what, what, they don't send you like yeah. vouchers to come in? <laughs> no, but the um, the Tom Carriage one, we've got our plates in his place because he put a, um, a tweet out asking people, to, like if anybody could make plates sort of thing so we made some samples and we actually took them down um instead of just sending them in the post because it's hard to try and describe stuff over the phone or emails and things so we just thought oh we'll, we'll take it down so he yeah. he asked us to stay behind for some dinner as well so that was good oh that's um, lovely yeah he's a nice bloke as well oh nice yeah um, do you find like yeah. do you find like a lot of your uh-huh. work in um getting commissions for things is you putting yourself out there or it more people coming to you is it is there a bit of a 50 50 split in that or how um do you feel that, that works probably it's probably people coming to us and most of the classes are definitely people coming to us because we don't really advertise anyway mm-hmm. um but like with the etsy thing we've got to promote that quite a lot so if i have a new product i'll, mm-hmm. I'll put it on social media and stuff um, <clears throat> everything else is kind of like they come to us so good fellows know what kind of pots we'll make um and if there's a chef wants like a specific thing then they can come to us and say can you make that 
Um, so I've done stuff like. Um, is that like a, a regular contract you've got? Um, Sorry, yeah. Well, is that like a regular contract? Like, it's not merely, it's just an as and when thing. But we've yeah, got yeah. a catalogue and in that showroom as well. So I've got like a couple of rain, big standard ranges with them, but then we can make bespoke stuff. So like there's um somebody wanted something for Master Chef when they were on there, so I had some little. Oh great, yeah. Uh-huh. So just things I can do. So There's quite a broad range, really, isn't it? Like, like you yeah, of places that you, you you get into as well, and um, and everything yeah. else that you do. Uh, it's like one thing we. Sorry, go on. That's okay. Carry on. <laughs> I was just going to say we do supply like local people as well. So like, um, who is our restaurant in? Oh, can't remember where it is now in Newcastle anyway. Um, uh-huh. It's been so long since I've been there since I've been anyway. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we we'll, like we we'll make plates for for local people as well and. There's a, um, there's a cheese shop actually in Morpeth just being on the emails there asking if we can make some oh, stuff. Yes. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, I know all about the cheese shop. It's gorgeous in there. Like, yeah. got, some, got, some, got some beautiful cheeses over Christmas time to give out to oh. um, colleagues at work. Yeah. <laughs> so what did, you, what did you do for the, the cheese shop? So we'll make um, brie bakers and we can do little cheese boards. And now because we've got the CNC machine as well, we can do like wooden stuff. So we can make wooden cheese boards with like picture cards and words and things on um Lovely. we make cheese cloches we can do like cloches or anything really because I, mm-hmm. I, I saw on instagram that you'd um bought this cnc machine and it just it took me back to being a teacher in the design and technology department with these like massive machines is it is it quite a, a bulky machine that you need a lot of space for um it's not too bad but where we are we've got two units so one of the units is just sort of like a a junk room basically <laughs> um but it's we've separated some of it off so one bit's like a tool room one bit's got the um the glaze materials and things in then there's another bit that was just ideal to clear out and put the machine in because it's about maybe three meters by square the machine so it is quite big um and there's not much else in that room <laughs> apart from the machine <laughs> but yeah so we found it quite useful then to have the sort of new well new technologies to the business um to help kind of keep momentum and keep interest and help you to diversify a little bit in, in your business during the last 12 months. Yeah, definitely. Um, because we, we literally couldn't do anything else and we don't like to just sit on our bums, but we need to be doing things. Mm-hmm. Um, so we started, we've got a 3D printer, just a small one. So we started doing like pottery stamps, like the uh, make as mark sort of thing. Oh, um, oh we, yeah. We can do like cutters and things on there. Um, we've been doing. Somebody asked her, do you know shisha like pipes? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Someone yeah. asked her to make the bowl bit for that, right. but he wanted a really oh, complex three D printer. Uh, well, it's um, he wanted a really complex thing because not thrown on the on the wheel, um, and that's quite easyish to do. But this one was a bit more complicated, so we had to print it out on the. 3D printer, and then we're going to have to get it sent off to get a mould made of it, and then we can sort of like take casts from that. Um, so it's a bit more like the cast product that we'll be making, which we don't really do. We normally just throw everything on the wheel, but this one's like impossible to do. It's just too hard. <laughs> um, so so that's kind of handy for doing like prototypes, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Um, and the CNC machine, it's it's kind of mainly for wood we're using it for. Um, so I'm making like pottery tools. Um, I'm going to show you on the screen. Now. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> what, 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 what was that you were holding up? It it's, like um, it's a thrown rib. So when you're throwing on the wheel, you can kind of use tools to shape the inside uh, of pots. Right. So it, right. That one sits inside the pot and bellies it out. Um, right. But yeah, we've been doing loads of stuff like that. And it can engrave on like metal and things as well. So we're going to look at possibly doing some more stuff like that but then we've also um been in touch with a blacksmith um who's just basically around the corner from where the workshop um and we're probably going to start doing some combined workshops with him and or um like some tools some pottery tools he can be he can do the metal parts and we can do the parts of things so i so yeah Basically, yeah, um, we'll have to sort of have different like parts of the business and like, like just expand it a bit from just ceramics. 
How how do you feel in terms of um, managing the business? Because it, it it's just you and Marv, isn't it? There's no one. Yeah. Yeah. Terrible. How, how does... <laughs> do you, is that is that I... is it just all consuming? Is it take all of your time? Do you feel like you get any free time? No. <laughs> <laughs> It's working twenty four seven. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I had wrote some notes earlier on. And I was just thinking about um, about what's good about the business, and it's a good point and a bad point because you yeah. are literally with me just every hour. Like I'll be replying to emails at like midnight and stuff. Right. I don't have to, but I just like if I if I don't, I'll forget about it, and then other things take priority, and I just got to do things <clears throat> that come along. But. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like in the same vein, it's like I can arrange work to do things that I want to do. So like if I want to go to a festival, I'll try and see if I can get a stall there. And then I'll be able to sort of combine work with pleasure. Like the Portugal thing as well. Like eventually we want to mm. go and live in Portugal. So I was thinking if I can try and do some workshops to to start off there, then um mm-hmm. then that'll be so yeah, so we can we can combine work with pleasure. That's one thing that I like about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Have you got any more festivals lined up for the rest of the year then? Because uh, ho- hopefully a lot of them are, are starting to actually, um, well, they should be running in the summer if uh, restrictions allow it. So have you got any more lined up? Well, Green Man have asked if we're, if we're still happy to, to go and I've said yes. But that's, it's kind of like a weird one because I don't know and nobody knows if there's going to be any restrictions in place. So yeah. I might have to limit the amount of people that come through the marquee. So that might mean that we take half the money that we would normally take, which would mean it wouldn't be able to do. But then I think we're just going to do it anyway. Um, see what happens because it's a new thing, and we'll just we'll learn loads of things every time you do something new. You learn something. So, um, and then there's the one in Kent in September, but I think I'm going to say no to that one because I don't think it's going to be viable money wise. So yeah, probably just in man, maybe wilderness. I haven't heard from them yet. Mm-hmm. So, well, fingers crossed you get a good to do something, that'd be great. Yeah, definitely. It'll be a holiday for the year. Oh yeah. well, it, sounds, <laughs> it, it sounds like a good holiday, doesn't it? Yeah, it's, oh, yeah. <laughs> do you feel like kind of going back to what what what's good and what's bad about the job? Obviously, you, you know, there I think there's obviously good sides and bad sides to to any role. Do you feel like the the positives definitely outweigh the negatives? I'm assuming that if they didn't, you wouldn't be doing it. Oh yeah, 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 of course. Um, I just like to have a complaint every now and then about stuff. <laughs> oh, everyone does, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> so, so if obviously you're, you you come across as extremely passionate about what you do, and you're obviously diversifying. You're doing all these new things to to make sure that that you and Marv continue doing what you love doing, and so. What is it? What is it initially that brought you into into pottery? Because you were fashion previously, weren't you? That was your degree. Yeah, um, but it's not really me. <laughs> I've kind of figured that out. Um, yeah, so I did like um, a B Tech in just like general design. So I did like three D and photography and fashion and. Mm-hmm something else I can't remember what um but yeah it was a, it was a toss-up between photography and fashion so I chose fashion but I kind of wish I'd chose photography now because it would have come in so much more handy um I mean you do what you do I suppose that's a skill you can you can maybe um learn now if it's photography that it's going to help the business it's maybe something you could if you have time because obviously you're, you're really busy but yeah, it's, yeah it you is. could do and I'm, I'm always taking photographs and I do do some little courses every now and then um but I also like screen printing mm. so that kind of if I've got any spare time then the screen printing kind of gets gets that time like I like you kind of do everything and it's really annoying because I yeah. like to do loads yeah. of things but I want to be good at them as well and I want to be able to devote the time to them to be good mm-hmm. and you just can't do it with mm-hmm. some things do you feel like because you've got quite a broad um a broad interest in lots of different creative areas do you think that helps you to maintain a sort of a fresh look on the the main bit of your business which is the designing the pottery and and doing the bit that you love and making stuff yeah I think so definitely because you can get inspiration from loads of different things um like for photographs or people's clothes you can see something there's patterns there's, there's all sorts of things everywhere where you look um 
so yeah it has and I think it's it kind of like it helps you to to think about design as well and like function and how things work um so when we make a pot most of the time we're thinking about how it's going to work so like a handle on a cup how it's going to feel when you when you hold it mm -hmm. if it's too small it's going to be awkward um and it's just things like that that we think about first rather than just making something and not not considering it and it's like we've got a, um, a commission coming up for a bowling green in Jarrow um, mm -hmm. I don't tell the room yet <laughs> but um, we're always doing something different so we're going to make a like a big bowling ball about probably about chest height um, and it's going to wow. be made up of loads of little different bowling balls um, made oh, by bowling. so we're going to get like schools in and stuff and um, just people will just turn up and make a, a bowling ball and button clag it to the side of this big bowling ball. Oh, and make something. That sounds amazing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah great. Yeah, Ed and I did um, a couple of years ago. What well, was more than a couple of years ago? We did something similar with glass blowing, and they got loads of people to blow these glass baubles, which then came together to make a glass bauble Christmas tree at Annick Gardens, and it was beautiful. And it was so it was so nice that it, it had a, a community side to it that it was it, it involved everyone. Um, so yeah. Do you do? Are you quite keen to do more of those things where you sort of are part of the community and your projects become um, sort of a, a, have a real community focus? Yeah. Well, that's why we kind of like started the clear team up because as a like as muddy fingers, we couldn't really get any funding from anywhere to do stuff like that, and sometimes people can't afford to pay for things. Mm -hmm. So, and especially in this area, it's like clusters a deprived area. Um, so I thought we'd set up the social enterprise um, and then we can try and apply for funding for things so we've got stuff from like the National Lottery and things like that um, and that's good because we can go into schools and do things or we can go into community centres and do stuff we can do bread ovens we can just do all sorts so, mm -hmm. so that's where um, the ball and ball thing is going to probably go through the clear team Oh that sounds like a really exciting opportunity um, think, thinking back to sort of being a creative person, there's is there ever a time that you feel like you have a bit of creative block and you kind of can't quite? Is there anything that you do to counteract that or try and get over that? Yeah, all the time, all the time. <laughs> I have a block. <laughs> <laughs> I think, well, especially over the lockdown as well, because you don't know what's happening, so it's kind of like you think well it's pointless making stuff because I don't know what's going to happen with this stuff that I'm making mm -hmm. um but I've just forced myself to do something every day and I think you've got to just go in and do it even if it's rubbish what you're doing something will come from it or it'll just it'll make you think right I can do this better tomorrow or, or I might start doing that project or you've just got to go in and do 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 stuff even if it's just clean or tidying up just go in and um, because we haven't, we haven't got students and stuff in, so now I can just make a mess of the workshop without having to tell you every night. <laughs> just, just going back to you, you mentioned your uh, your qualifications before, because one thing we'd like to do with the podcast is to um, is to get out to, to schools, colleges, and places like that. Um, mm -hmm. And you mentioned the B Tech you did. So, so currently, what would you, what kind of advice would you give to to young people wanting to get into the same industry um, as you guys? Um, I think some sort of creative industries are really hard because there's not that much training for it, not like proper training, like loads of sort of art training. Um, and you can kind of like learn about how to be creative, but you don't learn about the business side of it. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's important to try, try and either like with me, I did classes, I did pottery classes with Marv, um, like when I first started and then I kind of realized from there what was involved in it so um mm -hmm. I think try and like shadow somebody maybe or if there's any apprentices um or like trainee positions in a creative industry then go for it um I don't think qualification will be all and end all I think you just need to be fairly good at what you do and confident and have a bit of business knowledge not much mm -hmm. but just enough that you know um, so you can get out there and talk about things to people mm -hmm. like this. Do you, do you think, <laughs> as you were saying, Marv started the, the business about almost 20 years ago now, you were saying, 
how easy do you think it was to start something that long ago compared to how how it would be now? Um, I think it's probably harder then. And he kind of like, he had a, another job as well at the time. And then he kind of started doing the pottery and then that kind of take off, took off. Um, so, and he's had a lot of background in like pattern making and like 3D design and stuff like that. So that kind of helped with the design side of the business. Um, and then obviously with the two who are being there, you can get much more done with two people. So yeah. Yeah, loads better having been in a partnership sort of thing um, yeah. with somebody. Yeah, I so, guess it must be, it must be quite um, easy to get disheartened if you if you get if you feel like you're coming up against a wall with something, and there's no one there on the other on the other side of the table going, no, we'll we'll try and going around it this way, or we'll do it this way instead. Yeah, I mean, most of the time we agree on stuff, and we're kind of like um, we just know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Well, he kind of just leaves it to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just tell him what he's doing the next day. <laughs> well, what, what would a, um, in sort of not, not normal, non-COVID times, what would a typical day for you and Marv look like? Um, we would probably, we we'll always start late because usually we we'll have night classes until sort of half eight, quarter at nine. Um, so we normally start about 11-ish. We're not morning people at all. <laughs> um, and would probably either, not much time is spent actually making pots in the pottery. Like, believe it or not, like everybody thinks you just sit at the wheel all day and make pots and it's just not like that at all. Um, most of the time we've got a lot of like prep to do for workshops. And because we do stuff at like the biscuit factory and things like that and um, the laying and the Shipley, um, there's a lot of, work needs done beforehand and afterwards for most of the classes and for our students as well. Um, we need to learn new techniques to show them and we need to make new glazes and things and keep them sort of interested in the classes because some of them have been coming to us for like years, like literally years. Um, so they need things to be inspired by. So we need to get inspired to be able to inspire them. So there's a lot of like research and stuff goes on um, through the day. We, can't, we do make pots and stuff and then if, if we're making something you'll probably trim it um the next day so like generally you make a pot you'll trim it and put handles and things on the next day then you leave it to dry for a few weeks two or three weeks maybe um and then you fire it so it's fired once in the kiln so that's bisque fired to about a thousand degrees then we take it out and um, we'll glaze it and then we'll fire it again for another three days it's in the kiln for wow. it goes up about 40 degrees so it's just like it's such a long process to make a pot there's a lot of like that's why we're like oh the pottery so down it's going to be really boring <laughs> because pottery is quite boring it's just a lot of waiting around for stuff to dry and um, that's, that's interesting because <laughs> i've been watching that and i love it because some of the things they make are so ornate and incredible but i guess like you say there's there's a lot of stuff you don't see on that there's a lot of uh, the waiting well, i end up shouting at the telly most of the time so <laughs> <laughs> well, because that that TV is around, that TV show is around now. You, is that is that a sign that what you're doing and the world of pottery is getting bigger um, and more popular? Do you think? Um, yeah, and we we notice more people asking about classes and things as well when that show is being on. Um, mm -hmm. And it is good because it it shows people that stuff still made by hand, either hand mm -hmm. building or on the wheel. Not all just like pressed through a machine in China somewhere and then sent over here. There's actually people making stuff here. Um, and I guess I it's really good awareness for, for pottery in general, if it's um, getting to that widened audience. And if that, that has a, a positive effect on your business as well, because people are thinking, oh, I quite fancy making some pottery. Um, and then they yeah. find out where you are and, and join in with what you do. Yeah. Um, and it's like when the throwdown was at Middleport Pottery, we went down there and we did some classes. We did like raku and teapot making and all sorts, and they were really popular. Um, people then knew what it was. So people don't. A lot of times you go to people, oh, we'll do some pit firing. They're like, I don't know what pit firing is. Or, I don't know what raku is or horse hair or yeah. bara. But now it's kind of like a little bit more popular. So it's good in a way. Yeah, definitely. It sounds like it's um, still an emerging industry in terms of the masses but it's obviously a very skilled industry that that takes quite a while to to 
understand fully and really get your head around and all the skills and the different things that you can do and it sounds like you there's always a challenge out there for you that someone will come to you with something that you've not done before yeah you could you could spend like 20 lifetimes and still not know everything about pottery there's just so much and it's really scientific as well there's a load of chemistry involved so I've been doing like a glaze making course online um there's like an american sort of professor um and i've done two courses with him and it's just like most of it goes over my head because i'm like i'm not really a scientific mind but it's just really interesting the chemistry that goes on in the kiln and the heat work and all the different glasses that are formed uh -huh. that's for, is that for things like the oxides and the glazes because i remember you talking about that at the raku workshop well that. remembered yeah <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so like, so with glazes, it's a, it's a, it's a whole thing. Um, so there's loads of different types of glazes. You are kind of all made from more raw materials. So there's a lot of like feldspars and silica and flint and all sorts of stuff that goes into it. Um, and you've got it's a bit like a recipe. It's a bit like cooking. You've got to have the right base recipe to get the right finish. So like, if you forget to put some baking soda in your cake, it might not rise. Same thing with pottery. If you don't put, if you don't put like a flux in it, it won't melt at a certain temperature. So, uh, it sounds like there's a lot of trial and error and experimentation, and that would be that's a brilliant hook for students who who maybe don't have like an interest in science, but have an interest in design and creativity. It's, that, that's a really interesting way to slip some science in there without them really realizing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. There's loads of things in pottery. There's loads of stuff that you can learn from it, and there's history side of it. There's all sorts. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. And you, and you mentioned as well that um, there's people you've worked with before, and obviously you've got your own students who look up to you and are inspired by what you guys do as well. Uh, but do you have any any influences um, yourselves in 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 terms of how you uh, how you improve what you do? Is there anyone that you look to look up to, or in in terms of like the world of pottery and uh, globally? Um, to be honest, I don't really, I don't really like follow other potters as such. I look at a lot on the internet, but I don't know, I don't know names and things. I look at pots more than anything yeah. else. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, so more about the designs and actual things. Yeah, yeah, it's so yeah, easy to find people on the internet now, isn't it? You can just, you, you, yeah, you don't notice the I mean, names, you just notice the pictures. Yeah, it's like at the minute, I'm, um, I'm doing a conference we normally go to america once a year to do a clay conference um like sometimes we'll present there and sometimes we'll just volunteer there um but it's online this year so we've just got an online um subscription for it so there's loads of different lectures on there so it's like stuff like just watching lectures on different things could inspire you it's not necessarily like looking at a, a pot and thinking oh that's nice i may try and replicate that sort of thing it's like just just learning, I think, is the inspirational bit. Just learning different things. Continue, continue learning, continue looking. Yeah. Is, that, is that pottery CPD? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> <Can I definitely? laughs> well, we're getting towards the end of our time with you, Diane. Um, so one last thing, just to make it really clear how people would sort of find you or get in touch or be able to get, get more information. Um, where, where would they do that? How would they, what's the best way of getting in touch and seeing your work um, and maybe finding out a bit more about whether they could come and do an apprenticeship with you when, when things like that are allowed? <laughs> yeah. Normally, like the social media channels, like, um, well, we've got YouTube, we've got Instagram, so we're at Muddy Potters on Facebook, we're at Muddy Fingers Pot on Instagram websites um muddyfingerspottery.com but whenever there's only two of us so we don't really update the website very much so that like the instagram and facebook are the main things but then for our courses and classes um we've got an event break page so if you just type muddy fingers pottery into event break then our classes will come up there's not tons on there at the minute because we can't do tons at the minute but we're mm -hmm. trying mm -hmm. <laughs> well it sounds like you know once once all the restrictions are lifted and once um, things get get back to a, I suppose, a new normal, I think people can look forward to doing those sorts of workshops again. And I guess you and Marv will be there waiting with open arms, waiting to welcome everyone back. And your regulars as well, who've been, I, I, they'll have missed coming in and doing what they want to do with you. 
Yeah, definitely. We've missed all the students and everything. We're sick of the sight of each other now. <laughs> the dogs have missed all the students as well. Oh, <laughs> <It's a> funny <laughs> thing. <laughs> How many students do you tend to have, uh, Diane, when you when you're allowed to obviously when you're allowed to have the students? Um, how many? What's your cohort at a sort of given time? We're probably, we're probably seeing about up to a hundred people a week because we would have like twelve people in our classes four nights a week, and then we'd have like classes on weekends at different places. And um, would have like thrown classes, or like literally all sorts. Like every day, would pretty much have something on. Um. Yeah. So yeah, so maybe about 70, 80, but I uh, sometimes quite a lot because we we'll probably do about twenty five people in the classes at other venues normally. Um, not at the minute, obviously. But yeah. yeah. Well, when we when we get this um the podcast out to everyone, we'll be sure to add your information on at the bottom so everyone can find you and know where to get in touch if they want to get in touch with you so, ah, that's brilliant. thank you so much Diane for taking the time to to talk with us and we're, we're very we're very excited to talk to you you are first interview so <laughs> yeah. that's amazing you are you're part of history here Diane in the making <laughs> <I hope>. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much cheers Thanks for listening to the Storyboards Creative Cast. I hope you'll join me for the next one. Don't forget you can find us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter to keep up to date with all our latest information and events. Why not subscribe to our YouTube channel as well? You can also email us at info.thestoryboard at gmail.com.